Well, the music ended, so I think that's my cue to get started. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you here today. Come on in, fill in the spaces. Remember those rows in the back are for people who uh, would like to socially distance. So if you're not one of those people, I would ask you to move forward and leave those spaces a little more open. There um, is the room that we used to set aside for social distancing is the little chapel. And that wasn't really being used, so it's been converted into a baby cry room. So uh, if any of you young parents with little ones uh, feel that your little ones are, are getting out of hand and you need to move out of the sanctuary, please feel free to use the chapel, which is over here on the east side by the east door, west door, sorry. <laughs> Don't hold me to that. Okay. Um, yeah, feel free to use that chapel if your little ones are crying, and that way you don't have to miss out on the whole service. We wouldn't want you to miss that. Yellow communication cards, you know how those work, unless you're new. So if you're new or a visitor, would you please grab one of those little yellow cards from the pew in front of you and fill that out and leave it on the seat next to you for someone to pick up? And if you're uh, even a regular those are communication cards. So if you need to communicate with the church staff in any way, that is how you would do that. If you have prayer requests you would like to communicate, please feel free to write those down and leave them for us. First time visitors, we have a gift for you. We would very much like for you to uh, step to the welcome booth, which is just out through these doors after the service. We have a gift that we'd like to share with you. Um, the class How We Love is one of the brand new Sunday school classes and apparently there has been so much interest in that that it's not fitting in the room that we were using downstairs. So that class, that would be uh, Johnny Lopez's class, is being moved to the library. So you can grab your coffee and sit down and get ready for class to start at 11.15 this morning if you would like to join the class How We Love. The Roots and Rocks hiking group is going to be doing their thing again. Eagle Island Trail is slated for this Saturday. That's March 20th. So be here at the church at 8.30 a.m. and you can carpool, drive or ride, and get to Eagle Island for a great hike. Okay. How many people here like to sing? I see some hands. How come our choir isn't that big? You all need to come to the rehearsals for the Easter Choir. They started this last Tuesday. So every Tuesday between now and Easter, there will be a rehearsal from 7 to 8 o'clock. It's just one hour of your time, and we would love to have the extra voices. So please, if you have not considered it, please think about that and join the Easter Choir. There's only a few weeks of rehearsal, and everybody will, I know, be very appreciative of your efforts come Easter morning. Um, that would be Resurrection Sunday. So, Sunday, March 28th, there's going to be a very short business meeting to vote on new members. So if you are a member of this church, please be sure to stick around after the service so you can vote in some more of your number. Uh, let's see, offering boxes in the foyer. So if you have um, contributions you would like to make to the support of the church or to any specific ministry, please drop it into the box out there and check your bulletin because we've got a lot more information for you there. Good morning, church. This is the kind of morning where if you make it to church today, you're doing well, right? Daylight savings time. I've heard at least one person say, I didn't realize till 1230 last night that this was daylight savings time and and uh, we're, we're going to be getting some people just kind of coming in here and filtering in. It's just one of those kind of days. So um, we're going we're gonna to worship, and you'll see people coming in, and we're just going to keep worshiping and praising the Lord. Um, so uh, on, a, on a more serious note, um, our member and, and, and dear friend uh, and also our nursery director and Awana commander, Debbie Buxton, um, her husband passed away unexpectedly on Friday night. And so... Um, just please pray for her and know that the service is going to be this next Saturday here in the sanctuary at 11 a.m. And so if you can make plans for that, um, then just please be praying for the family. We'd really appreciate that. So as we do that, would you bow with me in a word of prayer as we open the service? 
Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning knowing that we, we, we have nothing to offer you. We only hold by faith the offering that Jesus made, so we can only bring to you what we have received. And Lord, we know that you plan it that way so that you can receive all the glory. That as you have saved us and you have given us your grace, Lord, that we give you honor and praise and worship for all that you have done. And I pray today, Lord, that as we sit and we contemplate the week and all the things that are going on in our lives, Lord, that you will give us a reprieve this morning. Give us a break from those worries and, and please remove them from our minds so that we can focus diligently on you this morning to seek your face. Lord, for those of us that need to um, turn to you, Lord God, and in repentance, I pray that you would turn us. For those of us that need stronger faith, I pray that you would bolster it. For those of us who are struggling with what to believe, Lord God, I pray that you would infuse your biblical truth. And Lord God, for those that need encouragement, I pray, Lord, that the Spirit, who is the Spirit of comfort, would come and comfort all those who need it. Lord God, we, we come to you this morning, and we just plead to you for your mercy and your grace to just shower down and pour on us, Lord. And help us to know, Lord, that we cannot earn your love. You give it to us fully as we believe in Jesus Christ. And so your love is always fully extending to us at all times. So thank you for all these things, Lord. I want to pray for our sister Debbie and her daughter Megan, Lord. We just pray for your blessing on them, Lord. Encourage them. Uh, build them up, Lord God. Um, your word says that a smoldering wick will not be, you will not snuff out. Um, and a, a bent reed you will not break. And we, we look forward to that, Lord, that you are careful and loving and a good shepherd to us. And we pray, Lord, that you would shepherd our dear sheep. So, Lord, we pray all these things. We say hallelujah. We say come, Lord Jesus. And we say this all in the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. Would you all stand with me as we read the verse of the month? It should be 1 Peter 3. It's okay, we'll do six thir Luke 6.35. Oh, there we go. <laughs> First Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. First Peter 3.18. Would you please remain standing as we continue to sing? Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 76, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing Thy great Redeemer's praise The glories of thy God and King The triumphs of his grace Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean, His blood availed for me. Hear Him, ye deaf, His praise, ye dumb, Your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come, And leap ye lame for joy. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Our call to worship this morning is from Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 9. Let's read together. Seek the Lord while he may be found. 
call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 6 through 9. Our next hymn is a hymn written by John Newton, who gave us amazing grace. The words will probably be unfamiliar, but the tune is familiar. And then we will follow immediately with hymn number 406, My Hope is in the Lord. I asked the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. T'was he who taught me thus to pray, and he I trust has answered prayer, but it has been such a way as almost drove me to despair. I hope that in some favored hour at once he'd answer my request and by his love's constraining do my sins and give me rest. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul. In every part, yea, more with his own hand he seemed intent to aggravate my woe, crossed all the fair designs I schemed, humbled my heart, and laid me Lord, why is this? I trembling cried. Wilt thou pursue thy worm to death? Tis in this way, the Lord replied. I answer prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that thou mayst find thy all in. So we are able to say, my hope is in the Lord. My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me and paid the price of all my sin at Calvary. No merit of my own is anger to suppress found in Jesus 
invite you to open up your Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. And we're going to be looking this morning at the flood. And we're actually going to be covering a lot of ground. So uh, buckle up and get ready because we are going to go through this whole story. And the reason I chose to do that is because the whole account of the flood is one continuous story. It, it, it really fits together, so it's, it's really difficult to break it up, and there's a bit that is lost in doing that. So um, we're going to be going through this story and, and walking through this with Noah, and hopefully you're going you're gonna to feel maybe even a little bit wet. You know? You're going to feel a little bit like, like you're, the sea breeze. You're going to feel like you're encountering it a little bit. A number of years ago, I was out hunting in the Owyhees on the Oregon side, and uh, I was out driving in a four-wheel drive through some trails, uh, through some, some canyons, and a friend of mine says, stop the car. He says, Brett, I want to show you something. Right here, we're going to get out. So we get out of the car, and we start hiking in this, basically just this dirt road. And we start hiking through this canyon, and we start hiking, and we keep going, and then he finally goes, I see it. And on this hillside, there's this layer that has these shells in them. And so he goes, come on up here. And so we walk up to this, and we see just this layer of the hillside, which is falling off. And in this layer, it's full of shells. And we had just um, driven from Coos Bay, Oregon, which is where I used to live. So I've seen a lot of seashells. And so um, we go up there, and he goes, you recognize these? And I said, that's, that's right. Those are ocean clamps is what they are. I go, I can identify them right away. And so we were taking a look at these and just this one layer, just full of these ocean sea clams. And we thought to ourselves, how did those get there? Right? Well, we know that, that the flood explains this, explains why there would be sea fossils from sea life out here in eastern Oregon or western Idaho, right? How did these things get here? Um, archaeologists and different people 
have actually found fossils at the tops of mountains, oceanic creatures at the tops of mountains. How did these things get there? It's all explained by the flood. And so, so we can look around us. All we have to do is look not very far around us, and we can see evidence of the flood all around. You can imagine that um, this true event, those who had survived, those who were um, Noah's descendants, would have told the story of the flood, that they would have continued to carry on the story to generation after generation, because really, it's, it's the second creation in a sense. We have Adam and Eve and God creating, but there's a, there's a new creation that happens uh, with the flood, or at least a new age, a new start to the world, a, a second origin account. And so um, portions of this story, it would make sense that they had, would remain for hundreds of years as time passed on. As a matter of fact, the truth is that there are 270 stories Different stories from different cultures in the world of a worldwide flood that wiped out the earth. I'll just give you four. In Hawaii, the Hawaiian people, they have a story of the flood that the world had become wicked. It had become a terrible place to live. There was one man left that was good, and his name was Nu'u. He made a great canoe with a house on it and filled it with animals. The water filled the earth, killed all the people, leaving only Nuhu and his family. Sound familiar? In China, his name was Fuxi, the father of civilization. He had a wife, three sons, and three daughters who escaped a great flood. In Babylonia, so ancient Babylon, which is current day Iraq, ancient documents list ten great kings who lived before a great flood came on the earth. One man survived this flood, and all people on earth descended from this man. And then swing all the way over to the Toltecs of Mexico, and they have a a, a myth or a story that there was a first world that lasted 1,716 years before a great flood came that covered every mountain. A few men escaped this flood in a closed chest, in a closed chest, in a box that they had survived. And, and so there are over 270 stories like this of the flood account. And we believe that, that they're all based, even though they all vary in some degree, on the true story that has been passed down from generation to generation. And so we begin looking at the true account of the flood, the, 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 the very particular and, and very accurate account of the flood, starting in chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Noah was righteous, is what we see here. He was a righteous man. Now, this doesn't mean that he was sinless. This doesn't mean he was so righteous that he was without sin. It means he was a man of faith who trusted in God alone. And so that was what righteousness was. And you'll see this throughout the Old Testament, that when somebody's considered righteous, it's not that they are morally perfect. It's that they were actually people who followed God and had faith in him. Not only that, but it tells us about this man. It says that he was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. That means that he was a godly witness to an ungodly people, that he stood out, that he was a witness, that that they could look at him and say, uh, there is no wicked way in him like there is in us. He's not like us. He's different. And so they could see um, the, the, the light of God in him. And one can imagine that they might have even hated that, that they looked at his righteousness, that they looked at his blamelessness and, and saw it, and, and they, they didn't like it because it was so different than them. Of course, Jesus tells us that the world hates the light because it likes to stay in the darkness, and the light reveals the darkness. And so one can imagine that, that Noah was not the favorite of his generation. As a matter of fact, we're told that he was a preacher of righteousness, and so he would have been condemning them and calling them to repentance, and if they refused, and we know that they did, then they would be hating him all the more. So he was righteous, he was blameless, and then look at what it tells us here in verse 9. It says, Noah walked with God. Like like his ancestor Enoch, Noah walked with God. He, he, he walked with him with a relationship. 
He wasn't just a, a person who was trying to earn God's favor by being religious and going through the motions. He was truly in a relationship with God. And so it tells us that, that this man found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 8, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So now God is extending his gracious love to Noah because Noah is a man of faith. He's righteous, he's blameless, and he walks with God. And as Hebrews 11 tells us and just sums it all up, he was a man of faith. And brothers and sisters, as we begin this Genesis account, it's important to understand that this is the kind of person to whom God looks. God looks to, to these kinds of people, the kinds of people that, that want to walk by faith, the, the kind of people that are willing to stand out from their culture and look different, and the kind of people that, that walk with him, that walk in a relationship with him. Isn't it wonderful to see that so early in, in the Bible and, and so early in humanity that it's the same thing that, that we do today, the same way to God uh, now is the same way it was back then having faith in God and placing your trust implicitly in Him. These are the kind of people that God looks to. And what does God do with the kind of people that God looks to? God gives three things to people who seek His face. And and this is an offer to everyone, but it's the people of faith who actually accept these three things. God's going to give Noah a three-part message, and you will notice that this is actually the way that God introduces the gospel to people. First, he gives a warning, then he gives instruction, and then he gives a promise. Let's take a look first at the warning in verse 13. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Last week, we looked at the idea that that though God was going to destroy the earth, he tells Noah that that's what's coming, that God tells his people what's coming so that they're prepared and so that they can respond to it. And so this is a warning that this world is going to come to an end. He's going to make an end of all flesh, and he tells them why. It's filled with violence, and so he's going to destroy them from the earth. And so God assures Noah that judgment is coming, and perhaps that was a bit of motivation for Noah to say, God, I know your judgment is coming. I need to lean into you completely for my life to be saved. And isn't that what the gospel is? That, that not only did Jesus die for our sins, but we must know that it is also the only way to escape judgment. That there is a warning with the gospel. You see, the warning is for all people that no one escapes standing before the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone one day will stand before the judgment seat. And so in the gospel is a warning as well as an offer. There should always be a warning there that if we reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, then judgment is certain, as Hebrews 9, 27 through 28 say, or let's look at verse 27 first, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. For each and every one of us, after we die, we go straight to judgment. And so that's something we need to have as part of our our understanding of the gospel, that if we don't turn to Jesus Christ, then there's a result to that decision. And that result is judgment. And if we don't believe in Jesus Christ, it's hell. Secondly, there's an offer of instruction. Notice what he says in verse 14. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. Its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. So not only did God warn Noah, but then he gives him a plan. He instructs him on what he is to do and what his instruction was that he is to make a boat. Now, this boat is unlike anything the ancient world has seen. We're going to show you a few pictures here, and these are all taken from the Ark Encounter that you can go visit, which is an attempt to try to make as close as they can as a representation and a replica of the Ark as possible. It was unlike anything the ancient world had ever seen. Its materials were gopher wood, or also called cypress wood. Nobody knows exactly what this looked like, but, um, or exactly what type of wood it was, but they, they knew that this type of wood was going to be able to hold up against water. Um, The inside uh, was made of three decks, as we could go back to that picture of the inside. It it may have had cages for animals, we don't know, but three different decks, three different levels, which if you can imagine in the ancient world, which have been quite a feat to create something like this. The outside, it says, is covered in pitch, 
to make it watertight. So the outside is going to be completely watertight, so is the inside. And then we have the size itself. Now, we don't talk in cubits anymore, right? So how big was this thing? It was 45 feet high, 75 feet wide, 450 feet long. That's one and a half football fields. Now listen to this. The longest wooden vessel known to man, the longest wooden vessel ever made was 212 feet long. This is over twice as long as any other wooden vessel that we ever know of in the history of mankind, meaning that Noah had a superior ability to engineer this thing and to create something like this that, that would last through the ark. It, that, that particular ship was called the Cuddy Shark at 212 feet. Now notice that, that Noah did all of this presumably with very little help, right? Because no one was going to build an ark who didn't believe in God and didn't believe that there was a need for it. And so he did this for quite some time, uh, maybe by himself, maybe with his son's help, hopefully he did. But he did this with not a single chainsaw, not a single modern crane, not a single pickup truck, right? He was able to haul all the wood and get it all into one place. He was able to construct this thing and design it and build it. And so when we see Noah in heaven, we need to give him a little credit, I think. It's an amazing feat. And notice that, that every, every piece that he put in was put in by faith. That God had instructed him, this is the boat I want you to make. And obviously he wasn't right there at water's edge. He wasn't going to drop this thing in the water. He was building this with land surrounding him, just like you can see here at the Ark Encounter, with trees and land all around. So you're building this boat on land with no ocean around, and everybody's looking at you, potentially laughing at you, mocking you, and you're building it anyways, board by board, by faith in God. And so Noah followed the instructions of God. But God didn't just leave him with instruction. God also left him with promise. Now, um, warning and, and instruction, no matter what they are from God, no matter if it's the gospel or a message of, of doing something, without promise is of little help. Because if God warns us of destruction and he gives us, and he gives us um, instructions, then, then we also need a promise. We need something to hold our hat on. We need something, uh, something that's a peg that we can put our hands on and, and hold us up when times are difficult. And so God is in the business of giving promises with his instructions. God just doesn't give you a Bible that says, this is who I am. He gives you promises that say, this is how you can survive. This is how you can live. This is how you can have hope and salvation. And so notice this promise that God makes to Noah, verse 17. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female of the birds according to their kinds and of the animals according to their kinds of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that, the God, that God commanded him. You see, God based all of these warnings and instructions on a promise. God made a covenant with Noah, a promise. Now, what is a covenant? A covenant is a solemnization of a social relationship. It confines a social relationship already in existence. So it makes that relationship solid. It, it makes it secure so that there is a relationship that is based upon commitment. We talk about this in our, in our uh, church membership class. We just finished this last week, that, that when we become members of a church, we are covenanting with them, that we are saying, making official our relationship. This is our church, and we are Christians, and we're going to make this official. It's a solemnization and a confining of the social relationship. And so that's what God desires to do with Noah so that Noah will know God is with me. God is committed to me and God is going to get me through this flood and the destruction of the whole world. Notice that God not only promises that he's going to save Noah, but that he promises because of Noah's faith that he's going to save Noah's family. Now, there's a lot of speculation on Noah's wife and his sons and, and their wives about their spiritual condition. 
And quite frankly, the Bible doesn't tell us about their spiritual condition. All it tells us is that Noah had faith, and then God makes a covenant with Noah that he's going to save his family. So at the least, what we can know is this, that God decides to preserve humanity through the family. One man and one woman in marriage having children. God knew that this was going to be the way that humanity was going to continue on, and so he saves the family. But it does encourage us, doesn't it, that God, when he is covenanted with us, when we enter into the new covenant with Jesus, that he's also interested in our families, and and he is interested in giving them grace as well. But God not only is going to save Noah and his family, he's also going to save all kinds of animals. Now, um, a lot of questions begin to be asked at this point. If God's going to bring all of the animals into the ark, how's that going to work? Carnivores, herbivores, omnivores don't usually get along in the same boat. Right? We have a hard time perceiving this. Uh, I saw one cartoonist who drew a picture uh, of an animal while on the ark with its feet up and all the other animals surrounding it and Noah standing there. And uh, Noah says, well, so much for the unicorns. From now on, all carnivores will be confined to the sea deck. <laughs> Another cartoon, uh, we, asked, we wonder about the dinosaurs. How in the world could he get dinosaurs on the ark? And another cartoon shows the ark sailing away while the dinosaurs sit on a mountaintop and say, oh man, was that today? <laughs> kind of feel like that today, right? Daylight savings time. What we are to know is that this was a promise for a new age. This was a promise Uh, from a world free from the corruption of the old one, a new start for humanity. And God was going to give a new start to Noah, his family, and the animals. And it was going to be a new start for a time, wasn't it? Because, of course, every every human that, that goes through something like this always brings sin tagging along. But we do know this, it was a new start, and God was was refreshing. God was starting a new world. And we, we are told here that Noah confidently trusted God. In, in an amazing statement, he did all that God commanded. He, he walked by faith and trusted in him. And, and why is it that every movie uh, about Noah shows him wrestling with God and crying out to God saying, God, why have you called me to this? That is not the biblical picture of Noah. The biblical picture of Noah is that he obeys God with total faith at every stage, at every step of his life. All it does is portray Noah as a man of faith. We know this is clear. Noah obeyed God without reservation. He had fully given his life to God, and he was willing to build a giant boat in the middle of the land to prove it. And and I'm just going to make a segue here and make a side point. Um, What would that look like in our lives? If every single thing God told us to do, we just did. And we said, Lord, without reservation, without holding back, I'm going to trust you. Even if you ask me to do something that I really don't want to do, even if you trust, ask me to do something I really don't like, Lord, I'm going to do it no matter what you say. What would that look like in our lives? I want to encourage you with this idea that warning, instruction, and promise are the way God presents to us the gospel. Think about Peter's first sermon. He gives a warning. He says, save yourself from this crooked generation. And he also says, you killed the Messiah. But then he gives them instructions when they say, brothers, what shall we do? And he says, repent and be baptized for forgiveness of sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so he gives them instructions, repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and receive the Holy Spirit. And then he gives a promise and he says, for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Isn't that fascinating? That in the gospel presentation, the very first sermon of the church was given with warning instruction, and promise. This is the way of the gospel. And so as we see the flood, I, I want to I encourage you at this time, this, this sermon's not going to end like you think it's going to end. But just understand this, it's going to end with the gospel. Okay? Because the flood encounter is a picture of Jesus' salvation of us. Just keep that in mind. Okay, so let's get into the flood story. The first part of the flood story that's talked about in chapter 7 is the embarkation. Get it? Embarkation? Okay. Yeah, thank you for those pity laughs. Okay, uh, chapter 7, verse 1. Let's talk about the embarkation. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, 
the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. You see, God not only commanded Noah to make the ark, but he also commanded him to get in. And so we, we must see here that God's sovereignty is guiding Noah every step of the way. He told him what to make this boat, and then he also commands him when to get in. And timing is everything, especially considering that they got in the ark the day that it started raining. And so it's very important that they got in the ark safely and on time, and God is overseeing this like a good shepherd and saying, now it's time, Noah, because it's coming. And so he's guiding him sovereignly as he will throughout this entire flood experience. And then God makes provision for the worship of him. God um, changes things a little bit. Um, They were to have one pair of most animals, but seven pairs of the clean animals. That way, sacrifices could be made without animals becoming extinct. And it's actually in anticipation that sacrifices will be made immediately once the ark is completed its task and the people exit. But this does show us how important worship is, doesn't it? That God actually plans for his worship and the sacrifices that would be made to him by saving seven pairs of all of the clean animals so that they could be sacrificed in worship of him. It's a huge risk, isn't it? These are the only type of animals like this. There's only seven pairs of these animals on the entire earth, and we're going to right get off the ark and we're going to kill some. That's an act of faith that God will preserve those animals because you're going to be killing some of these animals immediately afterwards. But this shows us the importance of worship, that God is willing to take that risk. God wanted this, and it was desire that mankind would enter into relationship with him by worshiping him. And God made provision by bringing extra animals along to do that very thing. But then in verse 4, a very interesting thing happens. God takes responsibility for making all living things and then destroying them. Verse 4, again says, For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. He leaves no question that it's him who is doing this. It, It wasn't because it just started raining really hard and they were in a monsoon season. It wasn't because something changed and altered the earth. God wants, wants all humanity to know that God both created mankind and he takes responsibility to judge mankind and to deal with the sin that's on the earth. And he does take responsibility because he is just. So, so we have to take out of our mind any kind of belief that God somehow was a bystander to the flood, that God maybe was just a helper of the flood. No, God was the initiator of the flood. He was the author of the flood, and he did this by making a choice to wipe out sin because he is just, and a holy God can only do such a thing. So that's the embarkation. The second point is the beginning of the flood, the, the second phase here, and this starts in verse 6. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Of clean animals and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth. And the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them, enter the ark. Okay, the same day that the rain started. They and every beast, according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature, they went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Now, this is a process, the entering of the ark. If you've ever taken a cruise, you understand this, that entering onto the cruise ship and off the cruise ship is a process. I still remember, I've only been on one cruise in my life, but as we exited, uh, we had to go at certain time slots. And so you wanted to get off, but you couldn't get off because everybody has to leave in an orderly manner. So it took a number of days for all the animals to enter the ark because they had to enter 
in an orderly manner. And so they were entering slowly, and it looks as if Noah and his family were the last or some of the last to get on, and then they get in, and then who's going to close the door? So then God comes, and he sovereignly, by his hand, shuts them in, locks it up, and that door is sealed so that it's watertight. But we go back to the earliest part of this, verse 6, and it talks about the age of Noah. And we ask the question, why does it give the age of Noah and all this detail about uh, the time frame? Well, you see, that gives this a historical understanding. That means that this is not taking itself as myth, it's taking itself as true history. It's giving us dates and times when these things happen that, that they can be recorded. And you will notice throughout the passage, it's going to constantly give us times and dates of how this whole thing proceeded and receded. And that's because it's a historical account. And as it describes this historical account, it tells us that things started off by the fountains of the great deep. We oftentimes think of rain when we think of the flood, but it tells us that, that the great fountains, the great underwater subterranean fountains of water just burst forth from the ground. And this is a huge point because when it says the fountains of the great deep burst forth, it indicates a complete transformation of the earth's surface. Now, this begins to explain why we see what we see in the earth today. There's so much that, that, that people have asked questions about, about the earth and why it is the way it is, that is explained by this very sentence right here. You see, great volcanoes of water would emerge. Tectonic plates would shift as the water moved its way to the surface. The erosion that would be coming would create great rivers and valleys and fjords as the, the water just kept piling upon and piling upon. And so there's a few things to consider as you imagine that this water is just pouring forth from the deep. First, as the fountains of the deep, it would have resulted in a great number of tsunamis. So not only is this water rising, there would be a great number of tsunamis as the tectonic plates are shifting. As the floor plates moved apart, molten rock would emerge, creating a new ocean floor, and the new floor rose, pushing up the sea level and causing a surge of ocean water onto the continents. So these would be great tsunamis on these continents and great rises of ocean water that would be rising at quick paces and they would be violently hitting the land. Not only that, but superstorms might have been created as a result of the supersonic uh, uh, jet stream uh, of water uh, from the crustal fracture zones, um, catapulting ocean water straight up before they fell back to the earth as torrential rainfall. So you have these great huge fountains just shooting up water pressure uh, from the ground and, and potentially going up and then turning into rainfall. And so you just have these massive storms that would have been created that would have been extremely violent. Not to mention you have twice daily tides with no continents to stop them. And so you can imagine the rising and the settling of the water just constantly moving and destroying everything in its wake. And so this explains a lot about our world, and an immense amount about our world. I'll just give you three things that, that came about as this happened. The first would be underground salt deposits. There are underground salt deposits all over the world, and the question is, how do they get there? There's one that's 180 miles long in Poland, and it can be explained as ocean water that was superheated, resulting in the minerals falling to the sediment and then being covered by layer after layer of sediment after, as the flood was receding. And so here's a picture of an underground salt mine. That's all salt as they've dug these major holes, these, these, these major caves through the salt. A second thing that, that would have come out from the flood is in Utah. In Utah at Catacrome Basin State Park in Utah, there are some 60 towering stone spires. Here's an example of one of them. And so the people, scientists have tried to understand how these spires emerged. But a flood makes sense of this. Pressure from the underground activity would have pushed sandy material through sedimentary layers like toothpaste being squeezed through the tube out of, out of the earth. The plume of sand cemented together, and when the waters abated, they were left standing. So as the waters abated and the, and the layers of sediment kind of settled away, then these plumes would have been left standing. And so these were like, you know, shoot, shoots and, uh, of sand that came up from all the pressure from the ground. And then the last thing is something we know very well. Texas tea, black gold, oil. How did oil deposits get under the earth? Scientists believe that oil is made from plant and other living material that have been buried so rapidly that no oxygen could get to them. 
As a matter of fact, they can only turn to oil if a certain chemical called porphyrins are not exposed to oxygen. The moment they're exposed to oxygen, then, then oil begins to degrade. The only good explanation for it is the flood, right? So you got here today in your car with gas because of the flood. We, we are constantly using energy and we are constantly using things that are a, a, a exact connection to the flood, that, that, that we, we got here today because of it. We're using oil that were created from these things that, would, that had died and were covered over very quickly. And so those are just a few examples of the, the aspects of our world that were created at this time. But not only that, it tells us that the windows of the heavens opened up. Rain started to, to fall in great torrents. And remember, that the, there appeared to be a canopy of water around the earth before this that kept the uh, earth at a steady climate, which would include there was no solar, or, excuse me, uh, polar caps. So there were no possibly polar caps. There was just this water vapor that kept the entire earth at a similar temperature. And at this point, that appears to be completely evaporated and gone and falls to the earth in torrential rain. And so not only is there a great flood that's going to fill the whole earth, but the whole climate of the earth is rapidly changing and it's coming down in an extremely violent way. And so just imagine if you were a human being living at this time, the thought of escape quickly dwindling. This chaotic world, which is all a picture of the wrath of God and the judgment that he brings upon sin. There was no escape. I mean, you can imagine them jumping in their boats, can you not? You can imagine them trying to get to the, to the tall mountains. None of them lived. Which takes us to the third point, the triumph of the flood. 717. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The water prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth, only Noah was left, and those who were with him in the ark, and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. The flood lasted for 40 days of continuous rain and subterranean waters bursting forth. 40 days that the world was in watery chaos. And notice that every single thing that God said was going to happen to Noah happened just like God said it would. God said, a flood is coming. But the rest of the people of the earth didn't care. They didn't pay attention. And if they heard, they ignored it. But then it happened just like he said it would. Everything happened. The people on the earth were, were not saved. There was no escape from this worldwide deluge. All things on earth died, and they were blotted out of life. They were erased from the earth. Human sin had led to the ruin of everything on the earth through God's judgment, except for those on the ark. And one of the, the really neat parts about this is it says that um, the water was 20 feet above all the mountains. And, and one reason for that is so that the ark would not become grounded on any land at all. God was still thinking about the ark when he brings the flood. He's still protecting those who are in the ark. So at the same time that we see this mass destruction of humanity and all life on earth, you see at the very same time, the very same event was creating a fresh start was creating a new way. And so we're not left with this hopeless perspective. We're left with hope to say, yes, everything happened as God said it would. And these people had brought their own ruin on themselves. They'd be given chance after chance. But God was saving a group of people and animals in the ark, and he was preserving them. And, and this is a theme throughout the entire Bible, which leads us to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The majority of the world will not turn to Jesus. The way to life is narrow, Jesus said. The way to destruction is very wide, and many people enter onto it. But God's story is the story of him redeeming a small portion of mankind. 
And that portion is what we often call a remnant. A remnant is something that's left over, right? That's what actually the word remnant means, something left over. And so when the Bible, when he saves a remnant, it means when all else is gone, when all else is hopeless, there is a remnant that will survive. It means that uh, those left when all else is lost are the remnant. There are always people who are left. When, when destruction will come upon this earth, there will always be a remnant. There will always be people who will survive and who will make it. And the question is, brothers and sisters, are we part of that remnant? Are we the ones who are going to be still alive when, when all is said and done, when, when God shakes everything up and he brings judgment on the world? Are we going to be the survivors? Are we going to be the ones who will still be here in the end? I pray that, that you are. And I'll be praying for you if you're not there yet because time is short, brothers and sisters. We don't know how much longer this world has. Jesus could come today and it will be over and we will need to choose today because today is the day of salvation. Leads us to the fourth point, the, the, the grace and the hope that comes and that is the waning flood. It takes up to chapter 8, verse 1. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the mountains and the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. Notice the first phrase, God remembered Noah. And it's the most important phrase in this passage. God remembered Noah. And this marks a change in the destructiveness of the account. The destructiveness of over is over, and now God is saving the remnant, the, the people who have trusted in him. For God to remember Noah doesn't mean that he had forgotten Noah and says, as he's destroying the world, oh yeah, you guys are still here. Okay, let's make sure you're okay. That's not what that means that God remembered what God remembered means is it means that he now acts upon his committed covenant with Noah, that God has not forgotten his covenant with Noah, and he's been maintaining Noah in the ark the whole time, and it says that he remembers him, and he's holding to his commitment to save them through this experience. The time of wrath of God is over. It had been proceeding. Now the wrath of God is receding. And it tells us that God receded his wrath by bringing a wind on the earth. And so a lot of us can ask the question, how would a wind on the earth really take care of the, the, all the water that's covering the whole earth? How would it actually get rid of it? It would be a really hot wind and it's sort of evaporating the water. What, what is the, with this wind? Well, well, those of you who know a little bit of Hebrew understand that the word wind and the word spirit are the same word in Hebrew, ruach. The word ruach, uh, oftentimes wind is associated with the Holy Spirit. And so think back to Adam and Eve, think back even farther to the creation of the earth when it says the Spirit of God, the Ruach, was hovering over the waters. Remember? Well, guess what? The wind of God, led by the Holy Spirit, is now on the waters again. And just as at the beginning, the, the, the Spirit of God was there hovering over the waters as, as land emerged and the waters were separated, so once again, the Spirit of God by the Spirit is now separating and, and getting rid of the water so that the land will appear. And so there's a lot of similarities to the original creation account as there is to the waning of the flood. And it tells us that God's grace is, is coming upon the earth at this time. He has not left it to itself, that the Holy Spirit is there and working, and this wind is getting rid of the water. Now, we also look at the timing of the waning flood. It tells us that 150 days has gone by, and that's about five months. And then 724 states that the flood was sustained for 150 days. But around the five-month mark, the water started going down. So after about five months that they're floating around, by the way, you know that the ark didn't have a rudder. It was completely being directed by God, exactly where God wanted it to go. They were just out there floating. But around the five-month mark, the water started going down. And then two months and 17 days later, the ark came to land and it settled on a mountain range in what is now eastern Turkey and southern Russia. Then for two and a half more months, they waited as the water went down even more. So you think about once your boat landed, how much you would want to get off of that ark. Man, I would want to get off that ark. 
They haven't really gone outside, so they had just been living for all of these months in the darkness of the ark. And so this detail, this historical detail, helps us understand how difficult it was for them, how long they waited and trusted in God. And then we get to point five, the drying of the earth in chapter eight, verse six. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot. She returned to him to the ark. For the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days. And again, he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening. And behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him anymore. In the 600th year, in the first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the coverings of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. So just, just by way of explanation, the following the experience of land or the appearance of land, the drying of the earth took five months to complete. So they've been in the ark for five months. Now just to get the earth to dry out took another five months. Noah then used a raven and a dove to measure the waters receding. So this is a measurement. So first he picks a raven, then he picks a dove. And oftentimes we wonder about the raven. We think, well, is that a mistake? Because he takes the raven, sends it out first, doesn't come back. And you wonder if Noah's thinking, okay, I guess we need to use a different kind of bird. <laughs> These guys don't return. But there's, there's a point to that. There's a point to why he used a raven first. Of course, Noah's a very intelligent man, and he's been living with these animals for months and months and months. One thing he knows is that a bird lives off of carrion. It's a scavenger. It lives off of dead things. Makes you think, right? It never returned. It found enough death they found enough dead things on the earth to just keep on living out there. And so that, that didn't tell Noah that they could live out there because, of course, humans and other animals don't live off of dead things, but the raven could. So there was enough land to know that there was a lot of carnage on the earth, a lot of death. The mass of humanity had all died and all the animals, you can imagine the kind of carnage that was still left even after so many months. But it not coming back was a good indication that the water was receding. So then he sends out a dove, and he sends out a dove because a dove is not a scavenger. A dove eats the kind of food that humans and animals eat. And so he wants to know if it's going to find food, because you can't release all of these animals into the earth, and then they starve to death, because then you failed, right? So, so he sends out this dove to figure out what's going on. He sends it out three times, and he waits seven days each time. So this is a very measured response. He keeps waiting Okay, she comes back the first time. She comes back without food. So he waits another seven days and is waiting for the water to recede. He waits a second time, sends her out, and she comes back with a fresh olive leaf, which is a real important detail. It's really interesting, a fresh olive leaf. So in other words, this thing wasn't floating around in the water for months and months and months. It was, it was freshly grown. And what did it tell him? It told him there were olives. And it told him there were leaves, which animals and humans eat olives uh, and, and animals eat leaves. And so it, it told him that they could uh, potentially go out and, and survive on the earth. But then he, he, waits, he waits because he needs a little more time. So then the third time he sends it out and it doesn't come back. Apparently, she found enough food to live on. There's a wonderful picture here of just Noah interacting with this dove too, isn't it? And you can, you can kind of get an idea of how, how the ark would have, would have been an interesting place as Noah interacted with all these animals in a gentle way as he treats the dove, and it says he brings her back into the ark. Then verse 13 tells us about a new era. Verse 13 actually says, in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. The importance of that sentence is that it marks the new era. This is a new time frame. In other words, it's saying in Noah's 601st year, uh, on the first day, the waters were dry. And so this was actually year zero. This is year zero. This was the new beginning. This was the first new year. This was the new year of a new era. And so that's the marking point that tells us this is the new period of time. And in this new era, listen to this, they removed the covering off of the ark so they could see if it was safe to come out. The, uh, the covering, the word for covering in Hebrew is the same word for the covering that they used 
over the tabernacle made of skins, animal skins. So I just want you to put in your mind and just put this in the back of your mind right now that the ark was covered by the skins of dead animals who had died so that they could save the people in the ark. Sacrifice for salvation for the people in the ark. And then when that wrath is over, they remove the skins and they look outside and they see that they can exit. They can finally leave. So in total, there were 377 days after they entered the ark, the earth was dry and habitable. Over a year they had been in the ark, and they're finally ready to disembark. And this is about the amount of time, interestingly, that we have been isolated because of COVID. I actually uh, heard this week that on Thursday was the one-year mark since our government determined that we were in a national crisis. One year was last Thursday. We're over a year now that we've been in this. Now, as difficult as that has been, imagine being in a stinky, smelly boat without being able to go outside, stuck inside for over 365 days. Imagine not seeing the sun hardly at all and never being able to go outside. Can we imagine that? Maybe we can relate really well today. But that leads us to the sixth point, the disembarkation. There's a time when that comes to an end. Verse 15, then God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing and every bird, everything that moves on the earth, went out by families from the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And that is the end of the flood. You see, God commanded him to come out. He told him when to go in and he told him when to come out. Noah was guided by God's sovereign hand. And then he told him to come out in families because God was going to restart the earth with families. And then Noah worships the Lord. This was a cleansed earth with a righteous man and his family, and the first thing he does is he bows down to worship the Lord. It marks a new day for for Noah. It marks a new day for humanity. Throughout the whole story, he listens to God's warning. He went into the ark by faith. He survived the flood. He now entered into a peaceful walk with God. God's wrath satisfied by the judgment that is now ended. And so this ending, when he sacrifices to the Lord, marks a new day between man and God, where God would be at peace with Noah after the wrath was finished. Now, I told you that that this is a gospel story, and I want to show you how. Please turn with me to 1 Peter 3.18. Does that sound familiar? 1 Peter 3.18 is the verse of the month. And I want you to see that 1 Peter 3 connects the flood with the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. And before we read this, I just want to explain to you what this text is going to tell us. It's going to tell us that that we all deserve judgment and wrath, but that Jesus came to bear the wrath of God for us. And so in that sense, Jesus Christ is the ark. And all of the waters of the flood and all the waters that came down from underneath and from above, they hit the ark and they pelted the ark, but the ark protected the people. The ark stood strong. The The ark received the wrath of God and saved the people through it. And then when they took off the covering that had covered them for so long and the wrath of God was over, they exited and then they were now close to God. And that is the gospel story, what Jesus Christ does in 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. In which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. It uses the flood and it uses the fact that that the the eight people in the world were safely brought through water, that that the water uh, of God's wrath comes, but God saves us through Jesus Christ as he bears 
uh, the wrath of God for our unrighteousness, him, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God so that we can exit out of that wrath of God at, that we have borne under, under Jesus Christ who's covered us into peace with God. So brothers and sisters, I, I want to leave you with this today, that Jesus willingly came to this earth and said, I will be your ark. Get in and you will be saved. Everyone who has sinned against God, which is every human on the earth, faces judgment, faces condemnation from God. But if you jump into the ark who is Jesus, then he will save you from the waters. And, 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 and the wrath of God must come upon us, but he took every bit of it, every, every pelting, everything that, that our sins deserve, he took upon himself by using himself as a sacrifice for us. So that now, as it says, that we can enter in to God through Christ, that we can be made alive in the Spirit, and as He goes into heaven, that we can enter into peace with God. And so, brothers and sisters, I I leave you today with this. Are you in the ark of Jesus? Are you protected by Him? And if you are, how thankful are we that He got us through the flood of God's wrath? That if you believe in Jesus Christ, the wrath for you is no more. You are now out of the ark. You are now out in the, in, the, in, the, in the promised land. You are now in the place of spiritual protection and connection and relationship with God. All through what Jesus Christ has done for us. So if you don't know Jesus, trust in him and he will be your ark and get you through the waters of God's wrath. And if you do know Jesus, it's time to be thankful this morning, right? It's time to praise him that Jesus has paid it all. And on the cross, he says about God's wrath, it is finished. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Lord God, we come to you this morning and and this massive account of the flood, and we, we praise you, Lord God, that you are a God who saves a group of people from what is coming Lord God, so many people think that they they need to be saved uh, for so many different reasons, but the truth is, Lord, we need to be saved from your wrath. We need to be saved from your judgment. But the most important thing, Lord, is that you save us from your own judgment through Jesus Christ, who is very God of very God, who paid the price for us so that we don't have to go through it, so that we can have a covering, so that we can have a place of safety, and we have come through in relationship with you, that we can enter into the holy of holies, covered by the righteousness of Jesus, and be in relationship with you forever and for eternity. Lord, not only are we thankful this morning, we're thankful for the day that's coming, Lord God, when we will see you face to face, and we can enter in your presence, and we don't have to have any fear. Our conscience can't accuse us of anything, because Jesus paid it all. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. What a beautiful message about equating Jesus to the ark and, uh, and how we're saved through Jesus. And I, I, think, um, I think maybe let's try to pull some things out of these songs that we'll sing here in just a couple of minutes um, that relate to what we just heard. This first song, um, We All Bow Down. I, I'm, I'm thinking about how when, when Noah finally, after all that time, steps out of the ark, and, and his first act of obedience is to bow before God and give him worship. And now we get to do the same thing. In our hearts, we get to, we get to bow before our Creator and, and sing this, this beautiful song, um, We All Bow Down. Would you stand with us as, uh, as we sing this song together? Princes and paupers, sons and daughters, kneel at the throne of grace. Losers and winners, saints and sinners, one day we'll see His face, and we'll all will surrender their crowns 
and worship Jesus. He is the love, unfailing love. He is the love of God. Summer and winter, the mountains and the rivers whisper the Savior's name. Awesome and holy, a friend to the lonely, forever His love will reign and will all bow down. Kings will surrender their crowns and worship Jesus. He is the love, unfailing love. He is the love of God. He is the light of the world. And Lord of the cross. And we'll all bow down. Kings will surrender their crowns and worship. Jesus, He is the love, unfailing love, He is the love of God, and we'll all bow down. Kings will surrender their crowns. And worship Jesus, worship Jesus, worship Jesus. He is the love, unfailing love. He's the love of God. He is the only one worthy of our worship. <laughs> Kings will surrender their crowns. <laughs> we'll all bow down. His majesty is just unfathomable. It's amazing. Looking, looking at this next song, too, and trying to um, draw comparisons to what it was that, that Pastor Brett was just talking about. Through the fiercest drought and storm, talk about storms that Noah endured through the ark. Through the fiercest drought and storms, what heights of love, what depths of peace, what, when fears are stilled and striving cease. This is our comforter. That, it, that, that comes. And then look at this next line. I love this, or the, the, the next verse. Um, Scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross, as Jesus died, what happened? The wrath of God was satisfied. Wow. <laughs> the same way that the ark took the wind and the waves, the wrath of God in that moment, Jesus takes the wrath of God for us. Amazing. <clears throat> In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. 
this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on Him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground His body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. What a cool line, too, at the end of that uh, song, toward the end of the song. I was just thinking as we were singing it. Um, From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. How cool is that? Like, like Pastor Brett had mentioned, the ark had no rudder. God commanded the destiny of that ark. And, and, and we think all too often that we're the captain of our own ship, right? That, that we control our destiny, that we control our own fate. This... <laughs> Jesus commands our destiny. That's awesome. It's good stuff. Sing to the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus the Lamb that was slain. Life and salvation His empire shall bring. Joy to the nations when Jesus is King. So come, come let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong. To Jesus, and He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise, sing now with voice. 
Christ is raised to Jesus. Sing to the King for His returning. For His returning, we watch and we pray. We will be ready the dawn of that day. We'll join in singing with all the redeemed. Satan is vanquished and Jesus is King. Say it again. Satan is vanquished and Jesus is King. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. And He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. And He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. Sing to the King. Sing to the King. <laughs> Amen. All right, well, you know... Um, have a, great, have a great rest of your day. Um, stick around for Sunday school. Um, just remember, as you guys exit, let's give the last couple of rows a few minutes to exit first, and then, uh, and then you guys are, are welcome to exit. And um, stick around for Sunday school. There's lots of good stuff going on in the Sunday school classes. Thanks a bunch for coming. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. And He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. Sing to the King. Sing to the King.